for coming to the Penn Literary Salon this afternoon. Um, I'm Alex Clark, and I'm really delighted to welcome Emma Healy, um, who is going to be talking to us about her debut novel, um, Elizabeth is Missing, which was published nearly a year ago. You've been out there in the public eye for nearly a year. Your book was first sold here two years ago. Um, and it has been an absolutely phenomenal year for you, perhaps culminating in winning the Costa First Novel of the Year Award. You're just going to begin by giving us a bit of a, a taste of the book. Um, then we're going to chat um, for about sort of 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions for you at the end um, before Emma goes across to, to Foils uh, to sign. So first, just a very big welcome for Emma. And give us, give us a flavor of the book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the book is narrated by Maud, who uh, has, uh, is living with dementia. And she uh, is looking for her missing friend. That's probably all you need to know, really. Um, and Helen is her daughter. You smell funny, I tell Helen as she bends to put down my tea. Smell funny how? She is indignant, though I've hardly insulted her. It's a sweet smell, I say. I'll know it in a minute. It's sweet, but it's not pleasant. It gives me a headache and makes me think of the mad woman. It makes me rub at my shoulder as if I've had a whack from an umbrella. Is it the tea? Helen says, holding her own cup under my nose. It's fennel. Oh, yes, that's it. How horrid. You haven't given that to me, have you? No, Mum. She takes a sip from her mug and then grins. I'd forgotten how much you hate the smell. You never used to let Tom and me buy licorice all sorts when we were kids. She pauses a moment as if this is a fond memory, though I remember her whining about it for hours when she was a child. What are you writing? She asks. I look down at the paper under my hands. There are just scribbles, meaningless scribbles, except I have a feeling that some of them might be words and I just can't read them. I want to ask Helen, but I'm embarrassed, frightened. When I look, she is biting the inside of her cheek, staring at me. I wonder if she has guessed about the scribble words. Don't worry, I say, I'll ask Elizabeth. This seems the right thing to say. I smile at Helen for a minute, but there is something not right. I try to remember what it is. An idea keeps slipping away from me. I can ask her, can't I? I look through my notes, but don't even have to read them. I know already. Elizabeth is missing. I drop my pen and fold the scribble sheet up, putting it in my pocket. Helen takes my hand. She's being nice, making an effort. I should too. I wonder what I can say. You look nice, dear. She makes a face. I am glad to have a daughter like you. She pats my hand and starts to get up. Can we go to see Patrick's grave, I ask. I'd like to put some flowers on it. That's done it. She smiles, widely, sitting again. She has dimples, my daughter. Still there, buried in her cheeks at 50. I'd forgotten. It's as if they were hiding and had finally broken out. We can go now, she says. And we get our coats on and get in the car. It's all done in a whirl. We stop at some point and Helen gets out. I hear the doors lock around me, see her mouth something through the glass and run off. The street isn't busy, but the odd person walks past. I don't recognize them, though. I don't think I recognize them. A woman with long dark hair turns the corner and comes towards me. She peers into the car as she goes by and stops, tapping on the window, pointing at me and then the car door. She smiles and nods and says something I can't quite hear through the glass. I pull at the handle, but the door won't open and I shake my head. The woman shrugs, waves, blows a kiss and walks away. I wonder who she was, what she wanted. Helen gets in suddenly, bringing a warm petrol smell with her. Was that Carla, she says, just now? No, I say, I, I don't. Who did you say it was? Carla? 
It's not a name I know. Helen passes me a bunch of flowers and starts the car. Are these for that woman? I ask. Who did you say? No, they're for Dad. We pull out onto the road and I settle back, the flowers dusting me with water. I like being in the car. It's comfortable and you don't have to do anything. You can just sit. Is he in hospital? I ask. Who? Your dad. We stop at a light and Helen looks at me. Mum, we're going to see Dad's grave. Oh yes, I say, and laugh. Helen frowns. Oh yes, I say again. The cemetery is huge, but it doesn't take her long to find the grave. She must come more often than I'd realised. We stand in front of the stone, reading it silently because Helen doesn't want me to read it aloud. We stand for a long time. I start to get tired, and it's boring waiting here. Helen has her head down, her hands clasped as if she's praying. She doesn't even believe in God. There's a mound of earth not far from where we stand. Someone's going to be put into the soil. What do you call that? Planted. Someone's going to be planted. I stare at the earth for a long time. Helen, I say, how do you grow marrows? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Emma, I guess one of the, the kind of first things to say about the novel is that it is primarily a novel of voice. You know, it's driven by one character's voice. That's a really hard way to write a novel. And it's also very hard when that character is, in a sense, losing their kind of subjectivity, losing a sort of grasp on reality. Just tell me about how you came upon this idea of writing about a character with dementia. Uh, well, my uh, grandmother has multi-infarct dementia, so she was uh, kind of the main inspiration, but actually there's been about five or six other members of my family who've had one form of dementia or another. So it was something that I kind of, in my teens, began to realise was this huge thing, and I was really interested in, in what that kind of meant and there were kind of so many stories from the family where people had done things and there would be quite often quite good anecdotes quite like funny sometimes as well as being really upsetting so I guess I was trying to find a way of getting into that trying to work out what was going on inside their heads um, and then one day my grandmother was in the car with me and my dad and she said my friend is missing um, and it turned out her friend wasn't missing at all. She was staying with her daughter in another town. But I thought, OK, that would be a moment I could use. What if her friend really had been missing? What if she just hadn't been able to retain the answer uh, when we found out what happened? So I, I kind of, in a way, that was like my, the moment that I found I could start to write a story about it. Because I had tried to write a couple of other stories before. Um, and they just hadn't really gone anywhere. It's kind of fizzled out. So I knew that I had to have a kind of more of an idea about where the plot was going. And I thought a missing persons mystery would sort of work because, partly because I hadn't written a novel before. And so I, what I thought maybe that would help me find a structure that I could work out how to get all these words into a book. Um, but also I, I thought it would kind of mirror the, that kind of feeling of losing your identity as well. So there are lots of things I could play with, I guess. Uh, but I didn't know it was going to be first person. I st I'd started writing it in the third person um, with a kind of horrible stream of consciousness kind of puncturing the narrative. It was really horrific, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, was, what was what was horrific about it? You couldn't keep control of it or you didn't? It just how did it feel? Hunky. It didn't really, it felt like it was very staged. It just didn't really work didn't flow at all, I didn't, really, I didn't even believe in the characters, so I thought that was kind of a sign that other people probably wouldn't. So I just, I felt, I don't know, there was, I was trying to get towards something and I'm not getting there. And then uh, I sort of took out a lot of it and put it back just in Maud's voice so that the narratives kind of blended more. Uh, and also I had been really resistant to writing it in the uh, present tense because I, I guess uh, when I started writing it, maybe the present tense is slightly less fashionable. I feel like it's very fashionable mm. now. I probably wouldn't have even thought twice about it. But at the time, I was very worried about that. Um, but actually, that's the only way I can tell the story because Maud doesn't, she doesn't remember enough to tell you what's happened 10 minutes ago. Mm. So uh, we, she has to, yeah. So once I had you know, got over all those worries, 
she sort of came alive. Still a kind of huge challenge, though. I mean, actually kind of inhabiting that first person voice. Obviously, you've explained that you had witnessed um, dementia. You'd heard lots of stories. You were very aware of it um, as, as a condition that you wanted to describe. But nonetheless, actually writing that, I mean, just say a, say a bit more about some of the decisions you made as you were going along writing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so sort of difficult to say because you get quite quickly into a, um, a voice, I guess. I mean, if they're working for you, they sort of happen, they feel like they happen very naturally. I think uh, a lot of it was um, to do with not being able to find the right kind of um, books that tell me what was going on in my grandmother's head. So it was, mm. it was partly a kind of exercise in exploration, trying to work out what was happening. And I found that I could read textbooks about the condition, or I could read uh, manuals on how to look after people, um, but I couldn't find all that much that kind of just tried to imagine what it might be like. Mm. So that's what I was really doing. And then uh, just about the year that I started writing, my other grandmother, who I was very close to, died. And I had uh, got a phone call when she was in the hospital from my mum, and she said, oh, you must come immediately. You've got to come and say goodbye. And it was about a two-hour train journey down to Bournemouth, and I was really devastated. And I, had, I just couldn't think of anything to do with these two hours. I couldn't read. I couldn't really concentrate. So I thought I would write down all the stories that she had told me uh, about her early life. And when we got to the hospital, we went through them. I kind of fact-checked, I guess. But it was just a lovely thing to do. She, was, mm. she loved to reminisce anyway, and it was a great thing to do in those kind of final few days. Um, and that really gave me the confidence to depict another time, because they were mostly from the 30s and 40s, her stories. So, um, so I think that helped with the voice. That really kind of gave me another angle, because uh, before that, I'd been really thinking about Maud as an 80-year-old, and that was it. She was just... Like, she existed in this one time, which obviously is ridiculous. And once I had thought about what she was like at 14, 15, uh, it seemed much easier to get into her. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been 14, so that was kind of was something we had in common. All 14-year-olds have something in common, right, whatever right. the times they, they grow up in, I guess. Right. Yeah. Just, just um, Tess, I mean, you have been writing since you were little, haven't you? I mean, you started writing stories when you were a child um, yeah, and then I, obviously yeah. went off, did all sorts of other things, including working in, in publishing. Just, um, just say a little bit about your sort of route into writing and how this book actually came about in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I have been writing for a long time. I, my mum found one recently that I had dictated to her, had obviously made her write down. There was a kind of scribble where I had tried to write it and then she'd obviously taken over. So and grand. Yeah, oh yeah, no, it's, come on, I've got a story in my head and you better write it for me. Uh, it's about a cat and a snake who go to the dentist. And at the end they hold hands, so I feel like I had kind of not quite grasped the fact that snakes don't have that ability, but anyway, never mind. So it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know, I'd always written stories, but then I think there comes a kind of point when saying you want to be a writer when you grow up sounds sort of fanciful, so I stopped saying that, um, and I started telling people that I was going to be a litigator. I really had no idea what a litigator did, but I had seen the film Clueless, and the dad in that is kind of like a frowny, grown-up sort of person, and they say in the film that he's a litigator, so I thought, well, that's obviously like a proper grown-up's job. I'll do that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was never really going to happen. Did either. you ever get anywhere near oh, being God. a litigator? No, absolutely, like nowhere near. I mean, all the subjects I took were like art, and I mean, yeah, they were just. That was never really going to happen. Uh, and then I had a kind of breakdown when I was uh, 15, 16, and left school. So I mean, even further away from being a litigator, I'd left with like four GCSEs. So uh, that kind of career where it was all about further academia. away from <laughs> litigation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I went, so I went into um, art college. I worked on my portfolio for a year and I worked really, really hard on it so that they would sort of ignore the fact I had no qualifications. Um, and I ended up doing a degree in bookbinding, well, book arts, which mostly was bookbinding for me. Uh, so I guess I was trying to get close to writing, you know, I was trying to get close to books. Um, but I was quite, I'd kind of given up on writing completely. And like, we even had a, a module for creative writing. And I refused to take part in it. I just didn't want anything to do with it. So you just, you just what sort of shut your your mind to it? You thought it wasn't for you? Yeah, I think I just thought it was. Yeah, I'd, I still hadn't quite got over the idea that it was just slightly fanciful. So yeah. I, I, 
read other people's stuff and thought it was great and it was really interesting. But I, and I, re I read tons of books, but I just never thought about writing them myself. I, uh, I, so I, start, I made them. But I was a terrible bookbinder, so that wasn't really going to happen either. <laughs> Um, bookbinding is, I mean, it's a lot of sewing, which I'm actually not too bad at. And if you get it wrong, you sort of unpick it and redo it. It's easy. But the um, main thing about bookbinding is glue. This is the main tool, really. So it's how you use glue. And at the end of each session, you are, you're judged on how pristine your book is. Uh, and I would have things stuck to me and like a grubby bit on the front where the glue had dribbled and I tried to rub it off. I mean, just, I couldn't make this perfect book that um, some of my classmates I'm could. kind of imagining a big chart on the wall with litigator, big cross through it, <laughs> book binder, big cross through it, until finally we got to write a, I better, I better write a book, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I worked in a bookshop for a year and I worked in art galleries and I loved it, but I, yeah, I, I suppose it started to creep back in. I started to write in my spare time. I, just, I never told anyone I was writing. I was so embarrassed if someone had found out I would have been mortified but um, yeah I started to write in secret and then finally decided if I was really serious about it I should try and get into an MA so I applied for the MA at UEA and was amazed that I got in although actually I spoke to my tutor quite recently and he said he hadn't really noticed until he looked again at his old notes how few qualifications I had he's like oh that's funny I wonder if I'd have let you in if I'd have noticed at the time so luckily, he hadn't really checked. He hadn't looked at my CV. He just looked at the piece of work I'd sent in. Um, so yeah, so that well, was lucky. Was that experience? Obviously, that is really the the foremost among kind of creative writing courses. Um, still, you know that that it kind of stands stands head and shoulders. Was that a very important and formative experience? Do you do think you would have become a writer without that? Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, it was really wonderful. That year changed a lot of things. I think I would still be writing the book if I hadn't gone to UEA. It was just that all those kind of light bulb moments that you hope for that might happen over 10 years kind of happened in one year. So that's, that was kind of what I felt I got out of it. But actually, it was just also really wonderful, like just a, a whole year to write and talk to other people about books. And, you know, because I would have colleagues that would want to talk about books for 10 minutes. And then you kind of get to that point where they were like, can we talk about something else? Whereas, you know, you get to UVA, you, all you, have, you can just all talk about books all day, and writing all day, and no one's like rolling their eyes. So it was, it was great. Um, I just, yeah, I felt I took it more seriously and learned a lot. Um, and, and it makes you think about what you're writing for as well, because although there's not a huge amount about the kind of book market, you just get an impression that actually you're not writing just for you or in a kind of academic sense you're there's this idea of other people maybe wanting to read work at, in the future and what are you going to do for your readers in a yes. way which i think that for me is really important the idea that someone else might enjoy what you're doing i suppose this does bring us back to um what actually became the subject for your book because um dementia is obviously you, novels always lag behind something that everybody is talking about and there I suppose they have it is not a subject that has been explored that much in literature but it is starting to be and if you think Andrew O'Hagan's new book features a character with with dementia Samantha Harvey's book too um, are you aware of sort of adding to that conversation being part of a sort of something that we're trying to describe in fiction yeah I think I mean I do wonder if I would ever have written it if I had started now I don't think I would have written it I think it was because I couldn't find that many examples at the time, sort of what, seven, eight years ago when I started, mm. that I felt I needed to write the book for me. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. Since then, there's been lots of, I mean, um, There But For There has a character that's, Ali Smith's book has a character that um, has dementia of some, like some form, you're not really quite certain which. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it does feel like something that we're all looking at. I guess as, I think all novelists use memory, right? So memory is a huge part of telling any story. You have to remember what's happened and you have to, you have to be able to have a dark secret or you have to have met someone previously or whatever. It's, there's a lot about time and, and what you remember or don't remember or, and how that affects you as a person. So I feel like it's a natural next step is to use something that where the memory is fractured or confused. So it feels, it feels like a gift for a novelist. Sounds a horrible thing to say, because obviously it's absolutely appealing. But, um, but yeah, dementia is kind of um, 
an ideal tool for a, a novelist. And also we have fewer taboos about talking about any kind of mental health issue or whatever. I think mm. people are happier to talk about people being vulnerable in that way. So, um, so maybe that's opened it up too. Now, I have to ask you, um, the book was a huge success. Many debut novels struggle, however great they are, however interesting they are, however original they are. Did it take you by surprise and how has it, how has it felt to yeah. you? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think when, you, when I, all those years ago when I used to say I want to be a writer and I grow up, I would kind of imagine like a slim spine and a bookshop and you would go in and you would see it and no one else would notice it, but it would have your name and then you'd walk out of the bookshop again and you'd have a little glow. And that's really as far as I ever got um, in my head. So it's uh, very strange to go in and have a table of your books. I mean, that just, I never even, it would, it's especially strange having been a bookseller as well. So mm. um, you, know what it, you know what it means, the kind of decisions that actually mean yeah. that your book is kind of on a table. Basically. Yeah, and that's a huge thing. And sometimes I still ask to sticker them because that's the bit I miss from being a bookseller. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. I, it was, it's very strange. I never expect. I still kind of think at some point I'll wake up and it'll all have been a dream. I feel like I couldn't have made up some of the things. Like, I had to go and meet some uh, people in uh, Milton Keynes for lunch. And I thought, could I have made that up? Could I have thought in, like, my fantasy of being published that that was part of it? I don't think I would have. going for to. lunch in Milton Keynes? Yeah, I just don't think that would have been... That would have, like, not that I have nothing against Milton Keynes, but I just don't think I would have thought this is obviously part of the glamorous life of being a writer. No. Can, maybe. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. I'm afraid it's, the, it's Milton Keynes and Can. Yeah. Alas. Um, we're going to open up for some, to some questions now. We have a microphone. I can see it there. If you put your hand in the air and wait for the microphone to get to you, who would like to start us off with a question for, for Emma? It's a shy, it's a shy lunchtime audience. <laughs> Somebody will, no doubt, yes, get the ball rolling, and then it's, we open the floodgates. Yes. Hi, Emma. Hi. Um, are you writing another book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been difficult to decide oh, a topic? Yes, it's been absolutely... I've been panicked, I think, for the last two years. It's, it's funny because almost as soon as the book was sold, I thought people were telling me how I wrote. So people would say, oh, you know, what you're good at is uh, looking at an issue and getting us to view it differently. So then I, when I was trying to think of the next book, I was like, right, what issue should I get people to look at mm. differently? Which is just the worst way to try and do anything creative. Um, so yeah, so I have struggled. I've, I also, you know, it's a difficult thing because you're so used to writing something that you're enjoying and then sudden, and you, for the first book, I, I mean, no one might ever have re read it, and that would have been okay because if it was the bits that didn't work, whatever, I could just leave. Where now I've got this uh, picture of a perfect book that I'm trying to get to, and obviously that's impossible. So um, I'm, I'm just sort of writing stuff that I think is fun, and I'm sort of hoping at some point that it will lead to something better, <laughs> better than just being fun for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I also had the same struggle. Like when I started writing this book, I really worried that this wasn't the right book for me. I was 23 when I started writing. I thought, like, how arrogant to try and write as an 80-year-old woman. But also, what a terrible debut novel. Like, you're so, everyone sort of talks about their first book being kind of semi-autobiographical, and obviously this isn't really. So I thought I was writing the wrong book. And then I have just had exactly the same problem with the second. I've just. I thought, right, I should go back and write about a young woman and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I grew up in London. I should write about London and et cetera. And now I'm writing about a man in his late 30s. I just sort of somehow couldn't write uh, someone who had any real, like, any of me in. It was too excruciating. So, uh, yeah. So, in fact, you're, the, the way that it works for you as a writer is actually to find something that's quite different from you quite kind of outside of you personally. Yeah, I mean, then obviously tons of you sort of bleeds in. You can't help that. That's, sure. I kind of expect that. But I think making them a different sort of vessel is really helpful because then I'm not second guessing myself or thinking, is that my opinion or is that my characters? Or, uh, or if I put something embarrassing that happens to them, will people think that's me talking about something that's happened to me? It's that kind of 
feeling like you're writing a diary and then you're asking someone to publish it. So it, I, that's what I was, that's what I'm really anxious about, I guess. So if it's someone who's definitely not me, even if I do put something seriously embarrassing that has happened to me in the book, people won't necessarily know. No, they won't be able to tell which bit. They won't know which wish. bit was anyway. So. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have another, another question for Emma? Yes, there's one right here, second, second bench. Thank you. What's been the biggest highlight for you since the book was published? It's a good question. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, I think the thing that's been the most surprising and that I've got the most from is the amount of readers who've got in touch. I never really thought about it before. Um, and actually, I'm, a t I'm really awful at Twitter. I'm, like, I never say anything original or funny. Or, uh, in fact, my whole feed is just me saying thank you to people. But um, I really do appreciate when people get in touch because it does encourage you to keep writing. Um, and the amount of emails I've had when people say, oh, either this has made me feel differently about my relationship with my mother or husband, or it's made me look at dementia differently, or it's made me kinder to someone in the supermarket, or that's been really amazing. And I would never have imagined that part. Um, the, yeah, the amount of readers who, or people who come up to you at festivals, or I had someone in Edinburgh who came up to me and, she took my hands, she just burst into tears, and I was like, oh God, what did you do? But it was just a really, it was kind of, sounds horrible to be like, it was wonderful to have made someone cry, but it just felt this, felt kind of important. Um, and yeah, that, that's been, and I would never have thought, you know, I would have been like, oh, you know, the, like signing lots of books and feeling important yourself, but it's, it's, um, it's actually just been the readers, I felt quite um, humbled and grateful to them, so. Also lunch in Milton Keynes, right? Oh, of course, yes. That was also <laughs> I forget our that. Yeah. We have another, another question. Yes, there. And then we'll come to the front. Hi there. Um, you talked a little bit about how you'd found lots of academic texts at the time, um, but that you hadn't found any, any fiction that really expressed this condition. Um, because you were, in some ways, you know, writing something that you hadn't you know, seen expressed in fiction before, did you find that there were lots of issues of sensitivity that you had to to deal with and, and how did you approach that? Um, yeah, I did worry about that. I think that's part of the reason that when I started to write it in third person, it wasn't working because I felt then it was from the outside. So anything that sort of amusing that happened would feel like we were laughing at the character and that was something I really wanted to avoid. So when I kind of found Maud's voice and it was from her and I knew she was telling the story, uh, that kind of that made much more sense because then if she's, even if we're sort of laughing, we're kind of in her head. So I never, I never feel like I'm laughing at her. And that really made a huge difference. But yeah, I was worried about things, especially, uh, especially using my grandmother's experience. So there were definitely times when I would go and visit her and she would throw a note away and I would reach into the waste paper basket and lift it for my uh, notes. And I thought that's, you know, how terrible it's been like, this kind of scavenger in my grandmother's house. But, um, but I mean, she had thrown it away. She wasn't using it, so, you know. Um, but no, I just, I felt, like, yeah, I did feel odd about it. Um, but I also felt that it made me closer to her. So I guess I, as I was writing, it seemed as though something, was, something more useful was coming about from it from in our relationship. And that kind of made me feel a bit better um, and then as I spoke to people about the project, uh, they were so generous with their stories and it felt like it was something that so many people were um, experiencing. I think they say one in three people has knows someone with dementia or is touched by dementia. I think that's really incredible. Like, I mean, what a high number for something that's so underfunded. Um, and yeah, I just, um, yeah, I just thought it was important enough that I kept going. Yeah, I did worry a lot, actually, I did. But I, I felt like Maud was like, strong enough that she was, she was the person telling the story. She could take it. Yeah, she that she was, what you wrote yeah, for her. She's not, a, she's not a weak person, I don't think. So I felt like that, that kind of got me through some of the, the worries about whether it was um, sensitive. Thank you. I think we had a question just here. The microphone's coming from your left. Hello. Um, I just wondered if you shared your writing on the way as you were working on the novel. And I'm especially thinking of the workshopping idea or um, scenario that you would have experienced at UEA and if you'd continued that in any form. 
in order to help your work. That's yeah. really interesting. I mean, to the extent to which it's a sort of collaborative process in some ways. Yeah, I mean, you... I had a workshop group before I went to UEA, actually, um, for about a year before I went. I was going to a, a kind of Thursday evening. It was just, it was like an absolutely brilliant group, and they were all so dedicated, um, and they helped me a lot. I think it's just, it's partly the... It, like encouragement that you need that somebody reads it and they like that section so even if you're kind of struggling with writing anything else at least you feel like well something's worked so I must you know I must be able to do it again somehow um, and also uh, the kind of encouragement where you haven't brought something for a few weeks and they say well we haven't heard anything from you like you're gonna get going so that you know someone expecting something helps as well uh, at UEA it was um, maybe a little bit more it was a bit tougher, I think. People were maybe harder on your work. But I quite enjoyed that. In fact, I had a friend who said, like, there's something wrong with you, Emma. You like it when people criticize you. But I just, I think I just felt that was the most helpful. If someone says, yeah, this is great. You can't do anything with that. Whereas if someone says, oh, this isn't working, or I don't like this, you feel like, OK, well, you can, even if you then actually ultimately dis discard their uh, comments, you can, you can, like, do something with that. So I, I guess, yeah, I felt. The workshop's really important. And we did carry them on for a year and a half, I think, after uh, UEA. So I stayed in Norwich, and several of the people in my course did. We've kind of had a break uh, for a bit for various reasons, mostly because I wasn't writing anything. Uh, and I've got a friend who, if she goes to any workshop, she, she'll have like 40,000 words, and you'll have one little tiny section, and you'll say, oh, maybe you should just rearrange this. And then she goes back and rewrites the whole book again. So we've banned her from a workshop <laughs> until she's got a full number. So uh, yeah, so, but I, I mean, I think they're absolutely invaluable. If you have a workshop group, it, uh, I think it changes everything, it changes the way you write, makes you really think about what you're writing. Um, yeah, they were the only people who knew I wrote. I mean, um, my best friends didn't know, but my workshop group did, so. Just a, a final, very quick question from me um, before you go, go to your signing. Um, how did your family react? How did, how did they react to the, to the book? They've been really pleased, yeah. I mean, I think there's a kind of confusion at first and, um, because part of it was, a, was kind of inspired by my grandmother in Scotland. My, the Scottish half of my family just kept reading it and going, where's this pier? There's no pier near where she lives. It's like, it's not actually a biography. I'm not, it is fiction. So there was a kind of confusion there a couple of times. Um, other than that, they've been they've very, been very pleased. Thumbs yeah. up. They must be very proud. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. You're going to be signing in the Foils bookshop. Um, please do go along. But first, a big thank you to Emma for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>